let's get let's get started. Am I still recording? I am. No big deal. I'll be able to crop that out of our video. Okay. So back to uh, back to myself. So I cover a lot of the online content for Siemens. Um, so certainly I'm a good resource for you guys. Um, if you have any questions from the operation and programming topics standpoint. So if you if you don't know me, there's my contact information. I'll give it to you again at the end um, in case you have any questions or need somebody to reach out for. Okay. So just a, as a quick update, we got a couple guest speakers coming up um, in the um, near future. A colleague of mine, Lars Fowler, is going to be doing a, an event in March. Uh, I think he was leaning to uh, advanced technology cycles. So we'll, uh, we'll have to see what Lars puts together there. And then Danny Vitulo, another colleague, is going to uh, dig into the world of tips and tricks within the Cinemaric control. So certainly keep an eye out for those. Come back, check them out. Um, I'll be on them as well. I'll be um, kind of emceeing the event, but we want to certainly expand this platform to allow others in the organization to kind of gain some access and so you guys aren't always bored just listening to me drone on. Prior to getting in the content, just let's give you guys a, some, some areas to look for, for some information. Um, if you haven't had a chance to, we just launched our new CNC for you website. We gave it a facelift. So the format or the layout is a little different now. Um, so you can still get to all the webinar material, or if you're not familiar with the, the website, you can certainly uh, go to the webinar sections and pull it up. Another thing that we created is what we're calling the content manager. So if you go to the CNC training classes and under CNC training, pick virtual training, you'll see there's a link to Cinemark CNC content manager. So what that is, is that is a, a document that has basically links to all of the videos that we've produced here so far, and certainly some of the stuff that my colleagues have produced um, over the pond in Europe. So you have the direct link as well as the YouTube link if it's on YouTube. And what's nice about this document is across the top, those are actually filter selections. So as you choose maybe your know, skill level or the technology or programming method, any one of those top questions, we will then highlight or make you a recommendation as to which videos, or which material you should take a look at. We're finding as we've been building so much content, the harder part is how do you know or how do you find the right video to look at or the right material to pay attention to? So this was our, this was our attempt. So we have this uh, content manager. Again, go to the virtual training. You can find it under the training classes and the Cinemark content manager. You can download this. And I would say if you get it, and you can certainly distribute it to anybody you want, but come, come back here and check out and download the fresh one, you know, probably once a quarter or so, we're gonna keep updating this document. Additionally, you can still get access to all of our on-site training classes that we host at our Elk Grove Village facility, so our in-person training. So that can be found by just selecting the in-person tab under training and your agenda and registration, that's all here at the site available. And keep in mind, all of the content, whether it be the virtual stuff we do online or these instructor-led classes we host in Elk Grove is completely complimentary. So please take advantage of it. We still have some great courses. Additionally to our main websites, um, those of you that uh, may know about it, we have that Mr. CNC YouTube channel, or if you're not aware, we do have our own channel we refer to as Mr. CNC, and you have the direct link here. So that is gonna have a lot of the webinar videos certainly we produce. We've also been building a lot of content specific to YouTube. So how-to promotional videos, little how-to trick videos. And I've also started a new series called YouTube Live. So we did a few segments of that in uh, over the summertime. Uh, we took a little bit of a hiatus because we've built a new studio that's gonna be our permanent studio and acquired a full-time machine in there. So keep an eye out for that. We're gonna be doing a lot more with the YouTube Live in the months coming forward. And you get a chance to see the new studio that we put together, I'm pretty proud of it. So keep an eye out for that on the Mr. CNC channel. But without further ado, why don't we get into the topic at hand, the topic we're gonna be digging into today, 
which is full five axis simultaneous or dynamic machining. And the attention here is certainly we want to give you kind of a high level overview of, of what we mean when we talk about five axis simultaneous machining. Um, I want to give you a few tips from the setup and operation side on how to handle setting up the five axis machine. But really the key here is, you know, what are some of the unique commands that not only make our control so powerful, but allow you to optimize your cam based tool path. How do we, how do we implement them and really what they are just kind of getting you guys aware. And hopefully this will be a nice teaser into getting you guys to want to come out and attend our five axis class that we host at Elk Grove, which is a week long. So the material that we're going to go through today in an hour or hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, this is a, a just a snapshot into what we dig into in a week long course. Okay, so we have three primarily con primary controls in our portfolio. We start with the 808, which is our entry level control. But our two main controls in this market space are certainly the 828 and the 840. Now, both controls are capable of five axis, but only one control can do simultaneous. And when I mean simultaneous, I mean, we can actually move five axes at the same time or then more, and that would be the 840 control. So past segments, past webinars, um, we've always kind of concentrated on both control platforms because the functionality that we were doing would work in either control. In this case, this webinar is specific to the 840 control. So anything we talk about here, you're not going to be able to find in your, um, in your 808. Uh, or, or your 828, shall I say, it's going to be specific. So you would, re, would be required to have an 840 if you want to do five axis simultaneous tool path. Now, there are three primary categories we break it down to as far as the machine makeup type in the five axis world. So these, this is your most common. Certainly there are, there are plenty of machines that break this mold, but we break it down to three, what we refer to as kinematic types. There's a head kinematic, or a lot of times we'll say head head. Then that's signifying that both rotaries exist up in the head or both rotaries would change the physical orientation of the tool, right? Your end mill, your drill. So that's what we refer to as a head kinematic. There are mixed kinematics in the market. That would be where you have one rotary up in the head that's changing the orientation of your tool, but just in one direction. And then you have a secondary rotary or down in the table. This kinematic is becoming more popular, especially in the mill turn technology. So it, it makes a little more sense when you have a rotary down in the table that's inducing motion or orientation change of your part, that that becomes the spindle axis of a mill turn. And then the tool, I can now orient the tool having a rotary up in the head to change orientation angle of my tool bit. So the mixed kinematic certainly is, has grown a lot of popularity in the mill turn side of the world. And then I would say probably the most common kinematic type is what we refer to as a table table. And that kinematic type is going to be what we look at in detail today. That would be, in my case, a B-axis rotary carrying a C, so a table table kinematic. And it's probably certainly the most popular, I would say, but each kinematic is going to have their own benefit based on your application. So just to take a quick look at what the motion of these different kinematics would look like. Here you see in the head head, I have an A and a C, both are inducing orientation change of the tool. This kinematic type can be very popular in aerospace, airframe, machining, um, anywhere where I'm not maybe doing a lot of big dynamic orientation changes, like where a machine pockets with tapered walls, but I need a large machine, head head kinematic works out well. Here is a mixed kinematic where you see the one rotary in the tool and the other one down in the table. And this is an interesting one that has actually a nutated rotary. You notice that the A isn't parallel or perpendicular to any linear axes. It's at an angle, usually 45, but doesn't have to be. That's what we call a mixed. Then we have our table table kinematic. So now we see two rotaries. The rotaries will only change the location of the part, but it's 
in turn changing the orientation of the tool by moving the part, right? So we're inducing a orientation change on the part. And then we have a table table, but a table table with a nutated rotary. So just like in the mix where you saw one rotary wasn't exactly perpendicular to your axes, we have our B in this case. Um, see that in a lot of high speed machine applications. Uh, the, the nutated axes or the nutated rotaries really kind of have two main purposes. One, you get a much bigger bearing surface, so they tend to be a little more rigid. Two, they have a much more kind of compact uh, motion, so you tend to see them in a little more high speed application. Or in the world of more horizontal oriented machines, if you look at the motion, it's much easier to take a tool and move it from vertical to true horizontal with a nutated rotary axis and point it directly in the Y as, I have, as opposed to pointing it in the X with just a standard A axis rotary. So, we have our different kinematic types, but how do I actually go through and set up this machine? Well, whenever I train people on how to set up a five axis machine, I certainly like to relate it back to something that uh, most all of us have done in our early journey, you know, journeyman apprentice days. And that would be setting up just a standard milling machine. It's a basic bridge port. You know, we look at this technology as this very sophisticated technology, but if you look at the root fundamentals, it's really no different than setting up a bridge port for argument's sake. So what would be the first thing I would always wanna do in a bridge port when I walked up to it, especially if uh, I didn't know who was running it before me? Well, I'm probably gonna wanna tram the head, right? We're gonna throw an indicator up in the head, we're gonna sweep the table, or as you see here, a tooling ring, and make sure that head is square. Well, there's no difference when it comes to a five axis machine you need to determine or define what we refer to as our datum surface, our surface normal, um, or our tool normal surface. There's a bunch of different terms for it, but it all really just says, hey, when I want my tool to be perpendicular to my datum surface, where is that surface? So we're gonna show you how to, how to establish that surface. Only once you've defined what the datum surface is, can I then square up my vise, right? We would bolt the Kurt vice down to the table, run an indicator back and forth. Same concept here. I have to have a datum surface to square up my vice, or more importantly, clock the coordinate system of my X, Y, Z. So that would be your next step. And then finally, only after you've done these two steps prior, can you set your part zero. So it's just like on that bridge port. I would never want to edge find my part and then go tram my head. My, my part location is not there anymore. So it's the same process. Now, when it comes to aligning my plane or establishing my surface normal, I'm gonna use the function called align plane. It's a built-in cycle right in our control. And what it allows me to do is it allows me to take a probe or a manual tool, it can work either way, touch three points on the surface I'm gonna choose as my datum surface, and then it establishes that orientation from there. Now, with that being said, if your part and your fixturing is all normal and parallel to the physical machines table, this step could be skipped. It's just one of those steps that you wanna think about first before you jump over it, because if I'm gonna set up a vise where, maybe it's like a Raptor vise or a fifth axis vise where I have multiple workstations and they're kicked at an angle. Well, now I need to establish the datum surface of each of those work holdings. Or if it's just a real fussy part, or you know the fixture wasn't machined exactly perfect, the machine can compensate for that. That's the beauty of five axis. So once I've done the align plane or decided whether or not I needed to do it on this machine, then I'm gonna just gonna go to our align edge. Align edge allows me to pick two points, basically measure off of a flat surface. You can also do it in a bore, uh, two different bores. But here I'm establishing, and really all I'm doing is I'm rotating the coordinate system about Z to make sure my X and Y are pointed the way I need them to, and that they're physically aligned to the datum surface of my part. So that's, that's a process you always have to do. Because in a five axis, you think about the freedom of the rotaries. I don't know where this thing is clocked. I need to, I need to def define that orientation. So once I've done that, then certainly I can do my Fine edge, go in, you can use our set edge or a whole host of different cycles in the control 
to define your zero location. That would be no different than running a three axis machine at that point. Now, where do these offsets go? Well, there's two places to allow the system to write the offsets for correction. There is, and probably what we're the most common or most used to in the industry, I could write the offset directly to the direct axis. So does the machine have an A rotary and a C or a B and a C? Whatever the rotary axis the machine has, I could put an offset there. However, there is a different way, and this is kind of where it starts to show you the power of the Siemens control. We give you a totally different way to align your coordinate system. And that is what we call a coordinate rotation. And that is defining an angle that rotates about a linear axis. So I'm never telling it my direct axis. I'm just telling it my coordinate rotation. So how much am I going to adjust about X, about Y, about Z? And that's the lower screen that we see here where I have my three different numbers defined. Now, when you use something like a line plane, a line plane will only ever write to the coordinate rotations. It does not give you the ability of writing to the direct axis. Because if we think of the nature of defining a plane, I'm just moving the coordinate system around in space to make it flat. Now, because of that, when I go to my align edge, I want to be very careful here. The line edge, I can select either to write to the direct axis or to write to the coordinate rotation. However, if I've already done a coordinate rotation adjustment, well, I can't spin the C if I've done a little bit of correction about X and about Y. C is no longer perpendicular to that plane, right? It's skewed at some angle. So, if you start to use coordinate rotations, do your entire setup with coordinate rotation. Don't do a mixed bag. Don't try to put an offset in the A or an offset in the C and corrections in the coordinate rotations. It's either one or the other. You can use either one, it's fine. There's certainly pros to, to both, but at the end of the day, you gotta follow through the whole process with one or the other. Now, once you've defined or put some offsets in, if you want to be able to track relative to these rotations, that's where you want to get, again, want to get used to the WCS MCS function on your machine's keypad or your machine control panel. And what that allows us to do is that allows us to change how the jog buttons and the hand wheel reacts. So am I going to move relative to the machine coordinate system, right? That's your base mechanics of the machine if nothing's been adjusted. Or do I want to move relative to this new work coordinate system I've just established? By selecting this button, I'm telling it I want to move relative to the work coordinate system. So now, as I jog with my hand wheel, it may be moving two or three axes at the same time, but it's really just trying to go parallel to the surface that you just established. And additionally, you're going to want to use a swivel function to present the surfaces as you've adjusted for them. The other nice thing with swivel cycle is I can continue to probe anywhere on my part with a swivel cycle and as if I'm doing the initial offset from the base zero location of the machine. So this is how you're going to want to allow your um, different measurements to kind of stack on top of each other. So swivel, um, if you haven't played around with it and you're not familiar with it, I would recommend going back to one of my earlier webinars. I've done two webinars one shop floor programming and one G-Core programming on the swivel topic, but that's a function you're going to definitely want to use in the jog realm. But now it's time to get into the world of full five-axis dynamic or simultaneous machining. So what do we really need here aside from the obvious, which is a machine that has five axes? Well, it's important that the machine is purchased with this option because that needs to be set up really from the factory. I would not suggest looking at a machine and saying, oh, I'll turn on the five axis simultaneous functionality later. There's a lot of commissioning that goes involved with setting up these machines. There's options that are required. Um, potentially, you're going to want to have some kind of measuring cycle like our cycle 996, or um, I know DMG, for argument's sake, uh, offers a function called 3D Quick Set that allows us to adjust for these kinematics. Um, especially as over time as the machine may settle or whatnot. So there is a lot of precursors here that I would need to, to have. Additionally, when you get into the realm of full five axis, 
you are going to want to have a CAD CAM system to take advantage of this functionality. You know, you can certainly program three plus two or maybe even a little four plus one in the system right on the shop floor. But when we get into five axis tool path, like we're looking at today, you're gonna to wanna to drive it from a CAD CAM system. And more importantly, you're gonna to wanna to drive it from a CAM CAM system that was designed for five axis capabilities. You know, there's a lot of great CAD CAM system out there that were only intended for three axis and four axis mills. And usually when I, you know, I deal with a lot of CAD CAM guys in post development, just debugging, and typically it's those systems that we run into problems time and time again, of getting the functionality to work right. You go to a CAD CAM system that was designed and spent a lot of R&D and time in developing a five axis strategies and tool paths, it becomes very obvious very quickly why they spent that time and money. Okay, so there's two segments within the five axis simultaneous world that we kind of break it down to. We refer to our face milling side of the industry, and that would be your machining similar to like die mold parts, um, any free form surfaces, any application where I'm machining off the tip of the end mill and only the tip of the tool. I'm not trying to engage the side or the flute of the end mill. That's what we refer to as a face milling application. And certainly different strategies and different cycles have been developed to help this type of application over the other, which we refer to as circumferential milling, and that is milling with the side of the end mill, right? So airframe, aerospace, any applications where I know the side of that tool is going to engage with the side wall, that's circumferential milling. If it looks like you're really close, but there's clearance there, you're still only face milling. You know, like if I'm dropping down into you know, a deep pocket and I'm just machining a fillet, right? And it looks like I'm almost machining with the side of the cover, that would not be what we refer to as circumferential milling. Circumferential milling, you are physically engaging the side of the flute with the part. And it's most common in airframe and structural parts. Um, some of your, your power components will use that strategy. You know, they're kind of a hybrid. That's why you see the, the little impeller here kind of in the middle of the two applications. But those are our two base categories when we're talking about dynamic. So let's show you what that tool path would look like. And oh, let me bring this over. I had it on the wrong screen. Okay, so there, sorry that my videos are a little jerky. Unfortunately, that is uh, WebEx lagging. But um, here you can kind of see. So this is what we refer to as face milling. Right, we're machining with the tip of the tool, as opposed to our circumferential milling. And here you see the actual fluid of the cutter is engaged in the part. So if you look at this application, and we're gonna talk about it a little more, I potentially have to control the orientation of this tool much, much tighter than I would in a freeform machining scenario, because any deviations I get in that tool orientation are gonna show up as surface finish issues, surface quality issues, dimensional accuracies. So you can allow a tool orientation to relax and move pretty freely in a die mold or a face milling application. But the minute you do that in circumferential, now we're gonna run into surface quality issues. Now in either application, to simplify the tool path, we've developed a function that is basically our TCP or tool center point programming functionality. And that is called Traori. And there's lots of different uh, commands that other controls have created to do some form of TCP. One of the things in our control that makes Traori so powerful is it's the same command for any of those kinematic types. A lot of times you'll see in controls that you know, especially if they, they were really three axis controls that they're adding five axis functionality to, they have to add all these ancillary commands to be able to handle, well, you need that for this kinematic, but a different turn on for a different type of kinematic. In our world, it's literally Traori, and it's as simple as just typing the word Traori. Now, what does Traori mean? I mean, it's kind of a funny term. Well, in the world of Siemens, we have a lot of verbal commands, and the verbal commands, it's really just an acronym. It's transformation about an orientation is what Traori stands for. And, you know, those of us that came from the ISO side of the world, I was one of those included until I came over to Siemens. 
Um, you know, we were used to everything having to have a G code, G in front of it, right? I had to say G one this and 100 that and 33 this. So in the beginning, these verbal commands seem a little foreign, but I'm telling you, long term, it's easier to remember an acronym, at least in my mind, than it is a, an equivalent G code. But here nor there, that's what Cherry means, or or any of these verbal commands we're going to go into. It's just say, it's just an acronym for different for a longer term. So transformation about our orientation. So what does Treori do? Well, it allows me to dramatically simplify the tool path coming out of my CAM system. And it also takes a lot of the responsibilities away from the CAM system that traditionally I would have to have done in a, you know, an older style control prior to TCP being developed. So if I look at program on the left, here I'm just trying to drive a simple move where I'm moving my x-axis, I have an a-axis rotary up in my head, and I'm going to move my rotary axis 45 degrees. So if you look at it, without Treori, we're doing our programming at the center of the rotation of our joint, basically, so we're not compensating for what's going to occur down at the tooltip. And our end result is if I was machining this part, I would end up getting a curve to my part or the tool would just be drifting away from that, that top surface of the part. So what would have to have happened? Well, the CAD CAM system then would have to know exactly where that rotary is in space. It also would need to know in this case, exactly what your tool length is. And then we would output a much larger program with a whole bunch of little moves to basically drop my Z axis while it's moving over in the X in relation to the rotation of the A to try to maintain a straight line. The programs gets much bigger. More importantly, my tool lengths are fixed to the program. So now I don't have the ability of changing tool lengths out of the control. I now have to repost my job if I have to just stub up on my end mill a little bit. You initiate Traori. Now the system is managing the kinematics of the machine. The control is doing it. So exact same tool path would now give me a perfectly straight movement at my tooltip. And what's really happening is now as I'm moving an X, we're dropping the Z exactly in relationship to the motion in A to be able to maintain a straight point at the tool. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. So I have a machine here. This is a uh, Cine train. It's a piece of software that we use. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen it before. It emulates a CNC control. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to just take a very simple tool path. For example, one, this is a basic tool path. And I wanted to just kind of describe a little bit more of this motion. So what happens is once I've initiated the command Treori, you see it here, I can do everything I want preparatory. But once I turn this command on, any motion induced by a rotary axis we will not change the position of the tool in relation to the part. It will move the linear axes around to maintain the same center point. So with Treori on, my tool will never change its position in relation to the part. The only thing that ever moves your tool around your part in five axis with TCP commands enabled is your XYZ axes. All your rotaries will do will change the orientation. So let's take a look at this part program. So I'm going to bring up my DMU 50 here. All right. So we're just going to position down, give yourself a good shot. We're going to position down to on top of my little tooling ball. And now the first command I'm going to induce is a 45 degree move. So you see how as I moved my X and my Z adjusted to maintain this center point. But the tool tip did not change in relation to the part, right? Anywhere I rotate it, tooltip in relation to my part stays a constant. Okay. Now this is the big thing that you gotta get your head around when you're using Treori. In a static orientation like cycle 800, the coordinate system is adjusted and aligned to the tool to allow any of our CAN cycles to work. In a dynamic orientation like Treori, the coordinate system is staying fixed to my part. So 
So as I move the Z right now, a simple Z axis move, I'm not moving relative to the machine's linear axes, I'm moving relative to the Z on the part. This is important to get your head around. So no matter where I run the part, right, moving all the way around this nice little job, the X, Y, and Z coordinates are staying fixed on that part. So the challenge here then becomes, well, what happens if I need to drill a hole? And this is why we still need to support functions like cycle 800. A function like cycle 800 will then align the coordinate system to the tool and allow me to drill a, drill a hole while using a can cycle. Now, could I drill a hole and output X, Y, and Z movement to track to this? Sure, of course. Um, it would be easiest though to use our standard can cycles. So always keep that in the back of your head. When running Traori, the coordinate staying is staying, system is staying planted on the part. Because this is important fundamental to understand. And, and this is pretty constant at again, any, any five axis control for sure. But it's really the core difference between Traori and Cycle 800 or doing some type of three plus two type of toolpath. Okay. So this is the start of how Traori begins to work. Now, there are a bunch of different ways to move or drive around my machine. We're going to look at the two most common ways to program my system. Now, direct access, which is what I just did, that is telling me that I'm going to specifically be moving my rotary axes. So this is a tool path, right, that is specific or fixed to machines kinematics. What do I mean by fixed or kinematic dependent programming is another term that we like to use. Well, it means that I could only ever run this program on a machine that has a B and a C axis, and they have to be a table table kinematic. It will not work if I move it to an AC machine or a head head or a mixed. So my program gets kind of tethered to that machine. Now, the other method is what we call kinematic independent programming. And there's a few different formats. We're going to concentrate on the most popular and the one that we recommend. And that's what we call vector based programming. In vector based programming, you are defining the sides of a triangle. And that's what defines the orientation or the movement that we're going to induce. Right? Now with that, since my A component tells me to just lean the tool in an X direction, or my B leans it in a Y, or C is my, my leg or my length in Z, well, since none of this has anything to do with the rotary axes, it'll run on any five axis machine. So for all intents and purposes, I can create a part program that'll run on any machine. Now, that is certainly a big benefit, um, but more importantly, and this is really why we heavily encourage you to adopt a vector-based solution, is if you look at just about any CAD CAM system out there, how do they hold their orientation of the tool in their, in their internal system before the output ever gets posted? Well, generally speaking, it's almost always held as a vector. This is the most proficient way to hold this kind of toolpath data. Well, if I'm going to program it as a direct axis, my post has to mathematically take my vector that the CAM system has and convert it to a direct axis and pass it to my system. And then when you get to the system, we then turn around and just convert it back to a vector. So there are, are mathematic pieces of this puzzle that are happening that now I can induce rounding error. So you will get a much more accurate toolpath if you pass a vector straight through the post because the post doesn't have to do any math. There's no rounding error. There's no, oh, I know your vector was out 10 places, but I'm going to round it to four and then convert it to a direct axis. Move. So it's going to give you a much more accurate part program. There are a whole host of other benefits here, but start, that's probably the biggest. So now we're going to induce that some a move. Here I'm rotating around to some position. So I wanted to tip. In this case, I was tipping my axes in a 45 degree orientation. So there you see. My coordinate system is still going to stay fixed to my part. So that's all the same. So the rules haven't changed. My X and Y is going to stay fixed to my part. So 
So here we move to different locations. So I'm doing an X and a Y move. So you see how it's moving the X axis now for a Y as opposed to the move before. These staying fixed, so everything's staying fixed to my part. And the physical orientation, well, that's occurring through my vector. So let's take a look at this little more detail. So first, I wanna just do a simple 45 degree tip, just like we had before. So if these are the sides of a triangle, right? So if I think about a triangle where my two sides are equal, I get a 45 degree angle, right? Well, it's the same thing here. So if I have an A component and a C component of the exact same value, then when I run this part program, bring it up again, I should experience, position everything back, there I'm on my top of my part, A3, C3 of one, there's your 45 degree. And before she spun 180 degrees because I had a negative one component. So the negative or the positive is just the direction I want the tool leaning in. Usually when you go to vector, this is where your operators kind of push back because they look at this and they say, I have no idea. I don't understand where the machine's going. Well, it's actually easier to understand this when you really get into some complex tool path because all you really want to know the tool tip, well, that's only driven by your XYZ coordinates. So at any point in time, you know wherever the tool is around your part based on the X and YZ coordinates. So the only really other thing that I want to be concerned with as an operator is, is the tool leaning in the right direction? I'm never going to know if that angle is perfect, but I want to certainly know, is it going to lean towards my fixture and crash or lean away and towards my part and cut? So that's just looking at the direction and the sign. So when I look at this, toolpath, I immediately know my X is pointing in a plus direction. And I don't have any B component. So that's my that's my base orientation. There's my Z move. And you can see my Y that's moving in the Y axis still, right? Come back, zero up. Now I want to do a 45 and 45 leaning in the Y, right? So there you go. Now we're leaning in the Y axis. So if I was to move in my Z and then my Y, there we go. And then when I go back, my Y is still clocked, staying stationary in part. So it seems a little foreign when you're first coming into it, especially if you've been doing direct axis all your life, but I promise you, give it a chance. And it's amazing how quickly it will become to read and more importantly, you will get significantly better tool paths by initiating a vector-based a vector -based strategy. Okay, so in conjunction with these types of commands, there's a function that we refer to as OREMKS and OREWKS. And that has to do with how we apply the offsets at the work coordinate level. And this is probably one of those little commands that gets so often overlooked. However, the results of having the wrong command can be catastrophic. So what does ORI MCAS and ORI WCAS mean or do? Well, this is orientation about the machine coordinate system, or orientation about the work coordinate system. And it is a preparatory command to Treori, and it tells us when I'm defining my surface normal. So here I'm just going to do a simple C3 equals 1. That means I'm going to stand my tool perpendicular or perpendicular to my datum surface. Am I taking into account only my machine coordinate system or am I using work coordinate system adjustment? So if I have my machine commission at Ori MKS and I have adjustments here in the work coordinate system, they will not get taken into account for your surface normal or your datum. So all of your orientation angles are going to be wrong. So if you look at this program, I have a little example right here. So let's, uh, my program's not running. So we're going to go grab example three. So what I'm doing, if I look at our part program, I'm just going to bounce between ORI WKS or ORI MKS. Now I'm using G511 as my work offset. So if we look at G511, I have doo -doo -doo, right here, I see in my symbol, there's some kind of rotation active. So if I go to details, I see, okay, 
we had decided to do a 15 degree adjustment about the Y axis, right? So this allows me to do a, a defining my orientation change. So if I was to tell my machine to go to surface normal, I'm expecting the B axis to rotate 15 degrees. So if we look at the part program and we run it, all right, the first thing we're gonna get down now, I'm not working off the tooling ball, we're just working off the center, right? So I just position her to erupt, zero, zero, zero. I'm gonna look at you right in the front so you can see the behavior. And now we're going to induce my C3 equals one, or my go perpendicular to my surface. And you see the machine tipped at 15 degree angle. I see it right here under the B axis. Now, if I go and give it any additional movement, so I'm doing my 45, 45, like we did before, you see the machine didn't move to B of 45. It automatically compensated whatever that offset was and added it to it on its own. So the system's automatically handling that. Keep in mind, your CAM system no longer needs to worry about all of the nuances of your kinematic. All it's going to output is the basically the relationship between the tool and the part, and any orientation changes between the two. We're letting the machine handle this. Okay, so now we initiate ORI MKS. I do the exact same command. I get the same G code or work coordinate system active, but now you notice. If I drive it to C3 equals one, she no longer compensates for that 15 degree. There's your 45. And this holds true for direct axis programming as well. So if I go to a direct axis, my B0, but I have ORI WCAS active, it's still compensating for that adjustment at my work coordinate level. I put in MKS, now I don't get that adjustment. So be aware when you're putting in offsets in the work coordinate system that you know which command is active. These are one of those commands that is active in the background, whether you realize it or not. So this is a boot up or default strategy command. You know, when I first start working with any five axis machine, any machine for the most part, I want to know what's modally active. What did the OEM set up on that machine? So if you go to either auto or jog, you expand your vertical keys over, there's a button called all G functions. Within it, I see under group 25, the default strategy, right? If I'm in a reset condition or I just powered the machine up, this machine is defaulted to running an Ori MKS from the OEM. For whatever reason, they determined that they wanted that to be its default. Now, if I program it and we get to the point where Ori works is on, you see it activates the new one. But because that's the default strategy, whenever reset occurs, it's always going to be back. So in this case, since my machine is commissioned for MKS and I want to use WKS, I'm going to program in my part program. The alternative would be um, really you'd have to talk to the OEM and have them change the boot up strategy. I'm reluctant against doing that. Somebody had a good reason to, to initiate this here. So I'm going to leave that alone. But what I am going to do is I am going to certainly address it in my part program. And it's as simple as we were just looking. You know, you come in, you give it the ORI WKS command sometime prior to Traori, doesn't really matter where. Um, it could happen after because it's just a modal command. I like to set up any of these kind of stuff before the, before the actual command is needed. Okay, so now we wanna talk about the behavior of our tool in an orientation scenario. So just like in 2D machining, where I have an interpolation type that's happening at the tooltip. So what do I mean by that? Well, a G1 is an interpolation strategy. It means I'm interpolating a straight move, right? A G2 or a G3, that's an arc, or I can do splines, right? These are all different interpolation strategies or operations when machining in a 2D plane. Once you induce now this new um, a new amount of freedom being able to orient my tool, I have to think about what's happening at my tool orientation. And there are some different interpolation types there. So what we can do is we can do what we call a linear interpolation. And that is supporting a command that we refer to as ORI axis. Or 
we can do vector interpolation or sometimes referred to as large circle interpolation. And this is our command called orivect. This is the same scenario as OriMKS, OriWKS. One of these is going to be active. You got to see which one is active on your machine or make sure you program it. By default, if you're curious why I would choose one or the other, well, I would say if you're doing a face milling or any freeform surfacing, machining off the tip of the tool, OriAxis is going to give you a lot more freedom as far as its orientation of the tool. So it allows for a much faster processing toolpath. When you go to a circumferential milling application where you're machining off the side of the end mill, now what's happening at the side of the tool is real important. So in that case, I would want to use an orivect command. But here, you see we're machining off the side of that part. So any deviation I would get within that toolpath would be shown on the surface of the, the part. So that's be a case where I'd want to use orivect. So here is a little example, just the exact same pocket. This is a very um, exaggerated example to show you the behavior. So we have a part program with four simple vectors or four coordinates, right? Every corner of this pocket, we're machining a tapered wall. One has OriAxis enabled, that's the one on the right. One has OriVect. So OriAxis, since it frees up the motion of the tool orientation, if you think of the behavior of a round axis or a rotary axis, you're going to get some kind of curvature. Well, that's what we would see here running Ori axis. If I'm machining off the side of the tool and I want to have a nice controlled surface, then by initiating Ori Vect, what the control or the system does is it basically creates a flat plane from one vector to the next, and it restrains the tool orientation to make sure that it cuts a smooth surface on the side. If I'm in a die mold, face milling, well, I can lose cycle time significantly with this method because you're, you're restraining your orientation. If I'm doing a aeroframe, aerospace part, an airframe part, and I'm getting faceting, that's where I would want to take a look at possibly leveraging this. I would say by default, you're going to default with OriAxis initially, but if you're getting heavy faceting on your part, OriVect can solve that problem. Now, the last command we're going to talk about in, in this segment is what we call orientation smoothing, right? So as we're going through, even in a scenario like OriAxis, I can find different cases where the CAM system is outputting a lot of vectors and a lot of dramatic vector changes. And this is just a, a behavior of when CAM systems start to build toolpath like this. It's, it happens, I don't care how good the CAM system is, you run into scenarios where you'll get inconsistent vectors just the way the geometry kind of fell. So we've developed a function and it's going to go in hand in hand with our cycle A32 or our hard speed cycle, although can be run without, called Ori Sun. And Ori Sun, you see the command right here, is orientation smoothing on, and it allows us to smooth the toolpath. So for a second. This for whatever reason, my video is not working. Oh, there it was. I didn't hit the sweet spot. Okay. So here you see, and I know it's jerky for you guys, but this would showing you what the toolpath would look like. I'll make this a little bigger without orientation smoothing on. And with orientation smoothing, now we're allowing the system to adjust and potentially filter out some of these dramatic orientation changes. Usually when I run into a problem where I'm asked by an end user why their machine's running so slow, why is my feed rate spiking all over the place, this is a very common problem. And you want to induce orientation smoothing or fix the toolpath, depending on which is more appropriate, to start to solve that. So let's start to take a look at the format or the structure of a five-axis program, how we would recommend to start to build them. The first thing is your header. And what you always want to do is you want to do any of your normal header functions, your safety line, you know, unit of measure, whether I'm in rapid or not, default tool plane, no cutter copy. This is all pretty standard. What I certainly recommend is make sure you call out which work coordinate you're using here. 
is the next command we always recommend is using Cycle 800 if it's available on the machine to basically handle a safety retract, square up your table back to surface normal, at least of whatever is being defined by the work coordinate you're using. And then you can cancel your Cycle 800 with a simple little Cycle 800 open close parenthesis. After that, if you want the full 3D graphics or five axis sim, uh, simultaneous graphics to work. You could then define a workpiece blank that could be done at the control or it could be added through the CAM system. I've, I've done it with both, but this just sets up the graphics for, um, for simulation purposes. It has nothing to do with your actual motion or your toolpath. Then from there, maybe some preparatory commands, whether or not I want to maybe turn some breaks off. You certainly could use SUPA. If you want to pre-stage to a safe spot, um, a lot of times the cycle 800 may be all you need. So this is a case where you could maybe not use the SUPA command. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with SUPA using our control, but maybe replace it with cycle 800 and then drive into a tool chain. And you could use obviously uh, number tools or name tools with the T equals. Once I'm there, then I want to come down, do a preparatory position before I turn on Traori. And here, even if I'm gonna run a vector-based toolpath, usually I would recommend either driving the machine with Cycle 800 or a direct axis orientation to get close. So the one thing that scares CAD CAM post builders about vector-based toolpath is since I'm not calling out a direct position, there could be two potential solutions for that vector. Now the system will always take the shortest path, but if I'm if I have a large decision and I'm right at that 180 degree plus or minus scenario, I could get everything clocked 180 degree out. And usually where that scares me is where I'm trying to lead in and maybe avoid colliding in some type of a fixture or something along those lines. I want to be real cautious about that. So it's pretty common to use direct axis positioning for our preparatory commands. And then when I get to activating, we'll turn on Traori and then jump to a vector-based solution while in toolpath. And then I get all the benefits of a vector solution. If I'm going to stop, retract out, there certainly I could use my preparatory command. Once I'm in my toolpath, um, I'm probably going to use cycle A32 if I want to use any high-speed function. But certainly I want to initiate my orientation smoothly with Ori Sun. And the Ori Sun command is not typically part of Cycle 32. Now, Cycle 32 does have the ability of programming the tolerance that's used for orientation smoothing, or you can program it by itself with an Ori Tol command. If you're not sure if the Cycle 32 that was set up on that machine supports the orientation for Ori Sun in the cycle, just program Ori Tol. O R I T O L equals. It's an angular value. That's how much orientation smoothing we're going to do. And from there, when I'm getting ready to shut down, I'm going to retract back, cancel my cycle 832, tray foof, transformation off. I love this word. This turns off Traori. So just like Traori is transformation on, tray foof is transformation off. Ori soft, orientation smoothing off. You disable. Then I can use cycle 800 to send the machine to a safe retract location, square up my table, maybe in conjunction with a SUPA command to preposition for part loading or unloading. And then from there, M30 is going to end my program. So what you're seeing here, this is a very typical structure that we train on how to set up five axis toolpaths. You know, when you look at a five axis program, all the junk in the middle, right? All that code, it looks so impressive. But at the end of the day, that's just toolpath. That's just moving the tool around. The most important thing that's going to happen is going to happen in the first 10 lines of code and the last 10 lines. You know, once I've turned Trey around and I'm engaged with the part, that's that's just motion. Um, it's really all the stuff that happened just prior to that is really going to kind of set myself up for success or unfortunately for failure. So that's really where you want to start to pay attention on. And it's probably the commands that get most overlooked when developing a post. Okay, so here, um, just to give you a couple real life examples, 
we have a program that was methodized with direct access, just a very simple tool path. This would be a circumferential style, right? So I'm doing some swarf milling, I'm machining around the part. The lower corner, you see the different vectors that are being output by the CAM system. So if we want to take a look at what a part program would look like here. Now, when I'm starting to prove out my jobs, right? So we're going to go to my program five here. I'll see maybe some comments in the beginning. Here's my safety retract with swivel. Then as we come down, turns on Traore, gets into my tool path, right? This is all direct access. Now, our simulation, as long as you have the three axis simulation option turned on, supports full five axis toolpath. So I can come in on the machine and we can take a look. And since I had the workpiece blank, I can start to see what my toolpath's gonna look like. So here we see we're, we're rolling around. We have a bunch of little vector components. So it's these vector components. That is where I could start to get some fastening air. Um, certainly, I'm creating this arc with a whole bunch of little line moves. So by going into turning on our high speed function, we also transform these points into a spline and project a spline around so you'll get a much more fluid geometry. That's what our tool path would look like being driven off of this style of a part program. And there you see our direct axes. So I'm moving the B or my C. Give you an idea of what the final toolpath would look like. Bring up the machine and run it. Go down. So here, this part was set up to be parallel to the table. Certainly positioned. Obviously, I had some kind of a vice underneath it. But there we see we've just come around and done the same exact scenario. Now, if I was to take a look at this part and take a look at it in a vector-based solution. Now it's going to be the same toolpath, but the difference, just like I showed you before, you're going to see an A, B, and a C component. And you don't need all of them. So if my B is not changing, it can be excluded, or my A. But if I look at this, and I wanted to figure out, well, what's going to happen with my end mill? I know where the tip of the tool is. Well, just again, anytime I see a value in my A, that means my tool is leaning in the X direction. In this case, it's a positive value, so I know it's leaning to the right. I have a Y component. There's my B. In this case, I'm leaning in my Y axis a little bit, and that is in a plus direction as well. And then I have my C component. And since I see that my C value is significantly larger than my A and my B, that means I'm tipping at a pretty mild angle. And I, I want to say when I made this, this was only a 15 or a 20 degree slope. This number here really doesn't matter what it is. It could be a whole constant number. It could be, it can change. I've seen can -cam system change it. It doesn't make any difference because the number itself from line to line has no bearing on each other. It's just the relationship of the three. Because again, this is setting up the legs of a triangle. That's how we calculate the angle. If we take a look at our toolpath now, let's bring up bring up the same program in example six, same preparatory commands. I'm using a direct axis to get position, but now once I get down, I'm using my vectors. You guys see a lot of decimal places here. I'm going to give you some recommendations on some default values. This always scares guys, right? Back in the day, we were always afraid about giving the machine too much data because it would slow down the processing of the control. Siemens control is the exact opposite. The more information you can give us, the better. The less rounding error or discrepancy we have from point to point by giving us more decimal places, the faster we can perform. So you want to give us a lot of decimal places. But if I look at this exact same part, it's going to be really unexciting because it's going to machine the same part. Same part, same toolpath, just with a vector-based solution. But again, back to why I would want vector, I am now driving the exact vectors of the CAM system, not a calculated toolpath that was calculated by the post. So any rounding error that could have occurred would have been alleviated, and I would get a much more accurate part with that being said. Okay, so from there, the next example I want to show you 
We showed you a little bit of a circumferential milling scenario. This would be if I was going to take that same type of part, but do more of a face milling. Here I'm using a flow line style strategy where I want to spiral around and machine off the tip of my part, tip of my tool. <clears throat> now, when you look at the vector solution here, this is generally where we start to choke, right? When they start to roll around these points, you start to see a large consistency of vector points. The vectors can, depending on how good the CAD-CAM sister's handling it, start to being adjusted and, and also the surface in different orientation, orientations. And this is where, if I'm going to start to run into real performance issues, I'm expecting to run into it. So if we look at this part program, and this one, I think I did this in direct access just to have something to show you guys. Here's our face mill. Right. So first thing I want to do is I'm not going to use any type of high-speed strategy, and I'm not going to use any type of smoothing. Okay. So if I go and I run it, and okay, I'll run everything, I want to run it right at 100%. 100% there, 100% there. So we start to move the machine. It's rolling around the surface. It might be hard for you guys to see with the lag and WebEx, but the machine is dramatically speeding up and slowing down around this curve. Where I can really start to see it more is when I look at my feed rate. If you watch the feed, man, it is bouncing all over the place, it's spiking up, spiking down. Generally, when I'm diagnosing a problem like this, the first thing guys would suspect is I must be running out of uh, computing power in the control, right? I'm starving for data. It just can't possibly run this type of toolpath. And that could be. In this case, it's not for sure. Now, how I know that is when you're running and you're diagnosing your own toolpaths, if you think the system's starving for data, go to alarm. Expand your horizontal keys over and go to system utilization and look at your interpolation fill buffer. You want to see this maintaining 100% or as close to it as you can. If this starts dropping down 100%, you are running out of space uh, or as far as not running out of space, but the buffer is running out of data, right? So now you got to address this somehow. But if it's holding at 100%, your problem has nothing to do with the computing power of the control but everything to do with whether or not the machine can react fast enough for what it's asking to be had. Now, maybe your machine just doesn't have the acceleration and deceleration to handle it, or there is so many dramatic orientation changes that aren't really required that the machine is trying to get to every single one of these points and induce every one of these orientations, and it's dogging it or slowing it down. So here I run the whole thing. I look at my cycle counter. And I see I got an 11 minute, 33 second cycle time. So now my next step, if I was trying to work out and you know prove out or figure out what's going on with this toolpath, I would probably want to immediately turn on some form of a high speed machining strategy. So I'm gonna go to a finishing strategy that's going to restrain me the most. Um, I'm going to give it some form of a Portal tolerance, if I don't know what it is, pick the fault value and it'll give a recommended tolerance or it should be matched to the CAM system. And then give it an orientation tolerance. So we'll leave it at the default of one degree. So right now, I would then want to go and run the same exact part. And I don't know if we'll see it that well in simulation, but we certainly will see it from cycle time. I can see it from my side. It's much, much faster and smoother. I guess you can kind of see it too. But the, the big proof in the pudding, so to speak, is when we look at our cycle time, how we'll let it run through completion. You'll see that we have picked up or reduced the cycle time significantly. So how is it doing it? Well, it's doing it in conjunction of a couple things, right? We are inducing orientation smoothing. So if I was to look at my all G-code functions, and I look for orientation, it's G-code group 61, orientation smoothing's on. I have my compressor active, so we're now machining a spline at the tip of the tool, right? So it's now, instead of trying to do a lot of straight jerky moves, it transposed the spline or doing an arc geometry through that. But to see at the end, look, I took an 11-minute cycle time 
And just by initiating high speed and turning orientation smoothing on, I was able to get it down to four minutes and 19 seconds. And then from there, if I could relax things even further because I'm in a roughing toolpath, then you're just going to pick up you know, more and more cycle time savings. So it's, it's a pretty common scenario you run into when you're getting into toolpaths like this where you're using the tip of the tool and you get a lot of orientation or vector changes. Pay attention. Oh, look, I didn't even run orientation smoothing on. So we probably would have picked up a little bit more. I had still have suppressed. But use cycle 32 enable orientation smoothing. Oh, actually, that's interesting. It was running. Oh, I may have made a little bit of a false statement. I didn't, but I think on this machine, because this was built for my personal DMU50, I have an RTAC. Um, I may have added orientation smoothing to the cycle A32 command. Typically, it's not there. So if you're developing a post, don't expect orientation smoothing on to be here. Um, by adding it after the fact, we'll ensure it's on. What I don't want you to do is add all the other commands that cycle A32 does do after cycle A32. So don't be doing G64, G64142, trying to run your, uh, you know, your compressor on your own with a comp cat or comp curve. If you don't understand cycle 32 reach out to me. I will be happy to give you a lot of information to coach you on what it does. You know, older systems, you had to program all these discrete commands. Cycle 32 handles them all. Okay, so we are winding down here. So I promised you guys some, some default or recommended starting points. Again, this is just a recommended starting point, but I tell you, I pull out this list nine times out of 10 when I, when I run into a problem, these are my first check boxes, right? So what are we telling you here? Well, first, if you're doing vector-based programming, so A3, B3, or C3, what you wanna do is you wanna make sure you're outputting eight places. Now that doesn't mean that it's always gonna output eight places, just that, if there, if it needs to, it can output at least eight places. As far as my linear positions, my X, Y, Z coordinates, if I'm in a metric, I want a minimum, and this is a minimum of five places. Inch, I want a minimum of six places. You can go more than that. We'll take as many as you can give us. Rotary axes, I want to do six places. When you get in relation to what we recall, what we'll refer to as the pole position, which we didn't get a chance to talk about that today, um, but in a case like that, for those of you that know what I'm talking about when we refer to pole position, you want to start to output 10 places. We want to avoid driving through that pole position, that singularity position. Uh, point density, as a baseline, I usually start with 0.3 mil, around 12 thousandths of an inch. Um, then you can kind of uh, adjust it from there. For my chordal tolerance for cycle A32, <clears throat> when you hit that button that's default, this is what it uses. So 0.1 mil for roughing, half a millimeter for semi-finishing, and I want to say it uses, I think, 0.05 for finishing, but this is the rough range that we usually recommend. Anywhere from two to five microns would be a good avenue to be in in a finishing. Assuming you don't know what it, the chordal tolerance is from the cam system. If the cam system has the ability of passing it through, use that. And with the orientation smoothing by OTAL command, generally speaking, I know I, I left it at a degree. Usually if I'm in die mold, I'm not machining with the side of the tool, I tend to run anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3, maybe as high as a half a degree. You could go higher. A lot of times you don't see a significant benefit above that. Um, for circumferential milling, when I am machining with the side of the tool, boy, I'm trying to restrain everything because I want to make sure I'm getting a nice smooth surface without any faceting. So now I'm going to use anywhere from 0.05 degrees down to 0 0.005 degrees. So you're going to use a much tighter tolerance once I start machining with the side of that tool. Now, the last command I wanted to show you guys is what we refer to as the two rot command. And this is a really cool command if I'm trying to do some kind of a recovery routine. So one of the worst things that happens to an operator when he's running a five axis machine, especially a five axis machine that has a rotary up in the head, right, where the tool can orient or change its orientation. You'll be down inside of a pocket, you'll be drilling a hole, you'll hit e-stop, you'll shut the system down by mistake, 
Maybe you heard something crunchy going on down there. And now all of a sudden you have a tool buried down into a hole. and You don't know how to move out in relation to it. Now there's a bunch of different methods or ways, but this is one way in working with the Traore function. So remember, I had said that Traore is going to leave the coordinate system fixed to the part. It doesn't align it to the tool. Well, the T rot, two rot command, T O R O T, will establish a temporary tool orientation aligned to the tool. Now, it will not move my XYZ zero location. So that's going to stay wherever it was on the part. But what, what I can do is then I can do an incremental move relative to this and I can move or track normal to that two rot command. And then when I'm done, I can shut it off with two rot off. So to give you a quick little example of how that works, when you get on a table table, this is not an issue. Because if you think about the mechanics of a machine where the table table moves, I can always jog Z straight up and I'm safe. So this thing, this scenario that we're talking about right now, this really becomes a lifesaver when I get into machines that have a rotary up in the head. So when I run my little test part, and we'll bring this up, okay? So I'm down in my orientation position. We induce a rotation. So initially, remember, everything in Z is tracking relative to the part. Now we're gonna initiate two rot, and now you see how I'm now moving in relation to the tool? That is because two rot is active right now. I just did a quick little G91, Z of 50 mil allowed me to back up. I could bring her back down 50 mil because I'm an incremental. And then when I do two rot off, my, my cancel command, now I'm back to tracking my original part work coordinate system. So if you can kind of visualize what would have been happening had that been the tool oriented, this quickly gives me a way to pull out in relation to that tool orientation. Now, another way to do it is you could certainly, a trick would be to use the overstore command. So if I'm in the middle of a program and I feed hold, right? We're running, we're doing something, it's off doing its move, I do a feed hold. You can go into overstore, you can start typing these commands, but a little secret here, the overstore command will use whatever was left in MDI. So if your operator sets up and just leaves a you know a, a, a two rot rescue command sitting in MDI when he's running his machine, if he hit overstore, that command would come up here, and now I can move relative to it. So to revisit the command, and we'll just jump back to the slide deck real fast. To do it, Trary has to be on. Doesn't have to be just before. Just just active. You do two rot t o r o t. So tool orientation, and then you're going to be in G91 because again, you don't know where your XYZ zero is. In my case, it was right there at the tip, but it could be anywhere in the part. So just switch to, to incremental, move out. When I'm done, certainly I would put it back to absolute unless I was ending my program and I would normally put it there anyway. And then to shut it off, I do two rot off, T-O-R-O-T-O. Okay, so without further ado, um, we are certainly open to taking some questions. So there's a lot of comments here, but some of it was from earlier with the audio. But um, for those of you guys that have some questions, I know we've covered a lot of material here. Um, use the Q&A panel. Um, try to use the Q&A panel, it's a little easier for me. I'm gonna go through the chat window first um, and we can go through some questions. Okay, so Traore is what we use to call uh, linearization for large movement. Well, it's, it's for um, tool center point control, right? I'm not sure if I follow exactly linearization for large movement. Um, it's really just going to uh, allow me to maintain that tool position no matter what my rotaries do, okay? So the backup question to that is, uh, why not leave Trary on at all times? You can do that. Um, I've had OEMs do that. However, it's pretty tricky um, for operators to move the machines around in jog mode manually when Trary is on. Because, you know, maybe I just want to tip my B axis out of the way as I move my X and Y. Next thing you know, the X and Y is tracking all the time. 
Um, also, you got to be careful sometimes driving through tool changes with Treorion, depending on how the manufacturer commissions it. So I'm not going to say I've never seen a machine leave Treorion all the time, um, but when I have, it used to it tends to be a little more dangerous than just enabling it when you want to use it. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, does the programmed relationship between the tooltip angle and the part remain the same for a nutated head kinematic? Uh, must we take the nutated angle into consideration within the part program rotation values? Okay, so when using Treori, Treori is allowing us to, to manage the kinematic setup. So we will take into account that deviation of movement because of the nutated axis. So whether you're doing direct axis, certainly in vector-based, it doesn't matter. We're totally handling the kinematic, but no, you don't need to handle the the nutation portion of it. Um, with Treori, even in direct, we're handling all that. So that would would, would all kind of allow me to move these programs around a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, more times than not, I will see post developers go towards vector base for this reason because it it just mutated heads get a little complicated, right? Or mutated axes. Um, if you are at B3 equals zero, B, or A3 equals zero, B3 equals one, C3 equals one, okay, so you're at a 45 degree angle, your tool is pointing in the Y plus direction, and you return the table to BC zero using a vector command. Um, so what you could do here is, and this gets a, a little tricky, right? So if I was to do a C3 equal one, it would move me back to a zero condition. However, on my on my machine, the platter spun 90, uh, 90 degrees. So it wouldn't drive that back. It would just leave my coordinate system pointing in the other direction. So if I want to reclock my axes when I'm done, this is be a case where I would probably want to drive it with a direct axis move. Because uh, if not, the vector by, by itself wouldn't necessarily have to tell the, that rotary to move. Uh, that answered that. Um, for a new nutated head machine, can I address the preposition moves uh, with orthogonal angles or must I output nutated comped moves? Um, I would say, Don, reach out to me. We could dig into that a little further. Um, hey, does uh, Ori MKS Ori works only work or adjust with Treori, or will it change the coordinate system with Treypoof? No, and it's specifically for Treori. So if Treori is not active, it's not going to have any bearing because at the end of the day, this controls what surface normal is with Treori active. Um, Alex, how do you determine XY orientation when using two rot command? Um, that <laughs> that is a that is a good point. You want to you want to be careful because yes, the two rock command you don't necessarily know which direction your X and Y are clocked in. Um, generally speaking, the only time I use two rot is if I use it in two scenarios all the time for recovery because I'm only moving my Z out right. I'm just trying to come out normal to that orientation angle. Um, the other time I've used it is when I had a, a system where they wanted to drill using our can cycles. But they um, they didn't want to use cycle eight, the cycle eight thirty or cycle eight hundred, right? They wanted to have a different way and keep Treori active all the time. So we'd use two rot, run the drilling cycle, which was only moving Z, and then cancel two rot, move my X and Y to my other location because I didn't always know way that, which way they were clocked or oriented. All right. Ba -ba -ba. Okay, we have a couple questions came in the chat. Um, or it works orients the work coordinate system by default and applies when Treori is off. No, it doesn't. Applies when Treori is on. Is there any reason why Ori works should be ever deactivated uh, when deactivated? So okay, so Ori works or Ori MKX. It's not that they're ever deactivated. So keep in mind. Remember, I showed you that there's a default strategy of the machine. So it's going to go back to one or the other. Define, depending on how the OEM commissioned the machine. 
So it's very possible that my builder and a lot of machines will always be in ORI WCAS. So when I power it up, when I hit reset, and then you wouldn't need to program it. The thing that we sometimes don't know is which strategy was chosen by the OEM. This is why I, I want to make sure you guys are aware of kind of what it does and to know, is it the modal strategy on the machine for power up or reset, or do I need to program in part program? Generally speaking, if you're not sure, or you're methodizing a post to be like a universal post, output ORI works. You're, you're not going to hurt yourself there. Um, that, that is the command that we would suggest to use if you have any other questions. Just always defer to ORI works as the base command. Uh, when using Terraria, how does the feed rate change when you program from the tool center versus the tool, the diameter? Um, I'm assuming you're referring to 3D cutter comp. Um, so the, the program feed rate would be the same. Um, you know, in 2D, we have the ability of, in G2 or G3 commands, increasing or decreasing our feed rate as we roll around those arcs. Um, however, if you look at typically five-axis toolpath, even in a 3D uh, cutter scenario, you're still always programming linear moves, G1 moves, right? Um, typically, it's always going to be a linearized toolpath. So then the feed would be the same at either scenario. Would I ever use G93 inverse time? No. Um, the control absolutely supports G93. I've run plenty of tests with it. G93 was a Band-Aid that control manufacturers put on because they had lag issues between their linear and, the, linear, linear and their rotary axes, right? So that's where inverse time really came from. Uh, we, were, we had an impeller blade and we're rolling around the leading edge of the impeller and we're getting overshooting or undershooting that's deviating in our surface because if you think of the mechanical nature of a rotary axis, it can never respond as quickly as a linear. So inverse time, slaved everything to the rotary axes. The servo loop timing on these new controls, and, and new, I mean, this is going back quite a few years for our control, is so tight that you no longer need inverse time to, um, to effectively fix that condition. So I have never run into an application where I needed to use inverse time. However, I have had plenty of cases where customers just like inverse time. It's what they've been using for years it will absolutely run. You could certainly use it. Um, when, if ever, do I need to use FGREF? Great question. And can you explain FGREF? Now, I intentionally didn't go down this road because this is FGREF and feed groups is a big topic. However, um, what I will tell you is when Traori is turned on, you should never have your rotaries as part of your feed group. And by default, they typically aren't, and you would never output an FGREF command. For those of you, and I'm assuming that Brian knows a little bit about feed groups and FGREF. So what, what, what feed groups do is they allow us to define whether we not whether or not we want our rotary axes to affect the, the toolpath speed in conjunction with my linear axes. If I turn Traori on, remember the behavior of Traori, any rotational moves have no effect of the position of my tooltip to my part. So since any rotary movement is just going to change my orientation position and not going to drive my tool along my tool path, why should I let it affect my feed, my feed interpolation or my feed calculation? So with that being said, the only time to use FGREF and feed groups, including the rotaries, is if Traori is not running. But if Traori is on, all you're doing is giving up cycle time. And I'm sure some of you maybe saw conditions where, oh, it made it run better. It probably was just because your rotaries were getting too unstable. So you were just slowing things down by inducing a feed group with your rotaries. However, if you had just put maybe a, a velocity limiter to that rotary, it would have had the same effect and you wouldn't have compromised feed in all kinds of other areas. So uh, don't add rotaries to your feed group if you're programming feed groups when Traori is active. Uh, is the orientation tolerance taken into account? The movement of the driven point of the tool tip uh, when the orientation is not correct? sure if I fully follow that. Jay, back that up with a, with a uh, 
an email or something to reach out to me. I'd like to dig into that a little more. Perfect. Um, okay, so back to some other questions. Boy, you guys are, this is great. You guys are active. Um, doo -doo -doo, where were we? Turot allows us to for drilling cycles with Traore. Yep, exactly. I don't like to use that benefit. I'd rather use Cycle 800, but yes, you could use Turot to do a drilling cycle. Um, there's actually a better one than Turot. If you wanted to do this, look at Two Frame. Because what Two Frame will do is it not only establishes the orientation to the tool, but it also temporarily positions the X, Y, Z, zero at the tip of the tool. So if you if you wanted to use this for some form of drilling, look at the two frame command. It's the kind of the sister command to two rot. Uh, when in turn mode on a mill turn or cycling hunter angles for tilting turning tools, yes, absolutely. So when you get to a mill turn machine, if you want to do any tool orientation setting, you're going to use cycle 800. Um, and on the control, we call it. Um, um, Orient, uh, tool tool orient, I think it is, but it, it's at the end of the day, it's using cycle 800. So yes, that is the exact application if you're going to be um, on a mill tune. Uh, Brian, when using Trary, how does the feed rate change when you program? Oh no, I already wrote that one. Uh, inverse time, we recommended. When if ever would I need to use FGraph? We talked about that. So don't use it, Alex. Uh, if you enable vector mode, with a direct axis preposition, will it always take the shortest direction? Uh, yes. So in a vector scenario, it's always going to choose the shortest path. But generally speaking, that's why I do like the preposition with a direct axis solution because I may not know where I was coming from, right? We came from some random tool change position, or I really just powered up, and and that's usually why I, I like to at least clock things to a predictable location with cycle 800 before we do anything else. So then in that case, then in theory, I should know where I'm coming from or have a little better sense. Um, on the subject of inverse time, we have the case where we might have a rotary only move with Traore on. While this happens, the linear feed has no effect. So there is a truth to that, and this is a scenario. Let me finish reading. It. Usually, in the case of the seamless control, allows you to have a feed rate for the rotary axes, if I recall, degrees per second. However, if we have two rotaries moving with no linear movement. Uh, what should the feed rate of each axis be? In this case, I've used inverse time for special edge case. Um, so what will happen? And uh, Jay is correct in this. So by the nature of our control, if, you, if you're moving down and we're doing some linear moves and some rotary moves, I can always program in a linear base feed rate and the rotary will calculate and kind of follow, right? However, when all of a sudden I get into a condition where I'm doing a rotary move by itself, if you watch the screen, <clears throat> the time base will change from degrees per minute to degrees per, um, degrees per rep. So in a case when that comes in, well, let's, you know, let's imagine I was running 100 inches a minute, and now all of a sudden I start to do 100 degrees a minute, everything all of a sudden dramatically slows down. So usually in a case like that, within the post, I will, if I detect a condition where no linears are associated, instead of switching to like an inverse time, I'll do a non-modal feed rate, which is an FB equals command. So I can change the feed, just for that move to overcome the fact that I'm now running in degrees per minute. It's funny, when you run in metric, the same condition occurs. However, the speed of millimeters per minute to degrees per minute looks a lot closer that most people will never even complain about the scenario. They never even realize this condition occurs. An inch, you really see it. Um, so take a look at the non-modal feed commands. That's usually how we recommend handling that. Okay, do four axis machines support Traore? If they do, will they take vectors, either four axis horizontal or vertical? So it is possible to certainly commission a machine, a four axis machine with Traore. However, I don't typically see it. Um, I think for the most part, just from an expense standpoint, you know, I mean, those are 
when you get to Treori, you need to have, the, even though you don't have five axis, you're buying the full five axis license. You have to run what we refer to as export restricted software, right? Because five axis technology, full five axis can't be exported. Um, so be careful with that. I would say it's very doubtful that you're going to run into a four axis machine with Treori. Um, all right. What do we got here? Um, able vector motor. Got that. Have a series of holes to drill at different angles. Uh, I.e., suggest to go to X, Y, Z, where way to avoid having cycle header for each drilled hole. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you you could in theory do that. Um, I don't know if it's going to hurt you to have cycle header for each hole. I mean, yes, you have a an extra command line, but you would still need a new command line doing your um, two rot functionality, right? Um, one thing to keep in mind with cycle 100 that you might not realize is although cycle 100 is a you know three plus two um, frame position orientation, if the machine has Treori and the OEM turn it on, which they usually do, cycle 100 can have a tracking mode. So it'll actually induce the orientation change with cycle 100 with Treori on. So I could keep everything really close and tight. So if I'm coming across my part and just doing small orientation changes of my drill, and I don't want to move back to some safety retract, I can turn that on and cycle 100 with tracking and stay really close. So I just do a little adjustment, um, you know, my orientation change, it tracks like Treori because it's actually using Treori, and then I go drill my hole. Um, so I would still say you probably want to look at cycle 100 for that condition. And Don, if you want to get into it deeper, give me a call and we can talk about it. Um, Brian, does OriWorks need to be programmed uh, with CAN cycles on a swiveled plane? Oh, I mean, probably if you're if you're using um, Cycle 800, I'm thinking he's, he's going to. No, OriWorks is only OriWorks and OriMCAS are only um, required or or active, shall I say, or being induced while Treori is on. So you know, if you're doing three plus two with swivel plane function like Cycle 800. Um, or it works, or MKS has no bearing on that. Um, great. I think I got everybody. Uh, this was some great engagement. We had a, we had an awesome turnout. I want to thank everybody. Um, you have my contact information. It's in front of you. If I didn't get to you or you ever have questions or need a hand, please, by all means, reach out. With that being said, have a wonderful Friday, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Good day.